thank you for joining me, Mr. Tyson. And uh, how big a deal is the landing of Chandrayaan-3 on the South Pole or near the South Pole of the Moon? Well, I'd like to think of it in many ways. First, as you said in the introduction, India is now the fourth country to send a mission safely to the moon. And I think this bodes well for a future where the moon becomes part of the backyard for the entire world. Um, four countries today, maybe eight countries in 10 years, and maybe everybody eventually. That's just the first comment here. Second, um, the South Pole is an intriguing part of the moon. No one has been there before. So you're the first in the door <laughs> to that part of the moon. What makes the South Pole interesting is, and I haven't seen this fully explained out there, so it, give me a moment to say, uh, you may know on Earth, as you go away from the equator towards the poles, the sun doesn't get very high in the sky. If you go up to like the north, near the North Pole, the sun just stays low on the horizon, never gets to high overhead. Well, that's true on the moon as well, except the moon also has craters. And so if you are a crater near the pole, and craters have rims, so if you're at the bottom of the crater, the sun never gets high enough to have its sunlight reach the bottom of the crater. So the bottom of the crater stays cold. It never heats up. And the moon has clearly been hit by asteroids and comets throughout its four and a half billion year life. You can ask, where did the water go from the comets? Well, if the comet landed where the sun shines, that water can just evaporate back into space. But wherever the water deposits Whenever the water deposits at the bottom of one of those dark craters, it stays forever. And we call it a cold trap. And this only happens at the poles because anywhere else the sun gets high enough to reach inside of the bottoms of the craters. Why is this important? Because future missions of astronauts, you don't wanna haul everything from earth to the moon to survive. And water, you can, if there's water there in abundance, you can drink the water. You can separate the hydrogen and the oxygen, oh. H2O, separate them. Those two recombine, make rocket fuel. So, so it's very likely that the future of moon bases will find themselves near the poles rather than anywhere else on the moon. Oh, so. Uh, we're looking at life there, but uh, I remember you spoke to us about uh, four years ago and you said space is tough. How confident were you that this mission, unlike the last one four years ago, would be successful? Did you really believe? Yeah, so uh, let me just make it clear that when, when Chandrayaan 2 failed, I thought to myself, okay, that's a learning experience. Right In science and in engineering, if you're on the frontier and you're doing something that no one has done before, uh, you kind of expect some failures. That's how this works. I was once told by an advisor in graduate school, he said, the day you stop making mistakes is the day you are no longer on the frontier. So I said to myself, as long as you learn from those mistakes, as they clearly did for this third mission, they looked back and they said, oh, this is where the altimeter failed. And this is, and we needed more redundancy in the sensors and in the mechanisms. And a redundancy is a good thing. Uh, normally it's not a good thing on earth. Don't be redundant, you know, <laughs> but in space missions, if, if one piece of material has a task and that task fails and that affects the entire mission, what you want is a backup for that. And that would be a redundancy plan. So once I saw that this next mission built in corrections to the, to the, to the second mission, I said, okay, this will, this will surely go in. If it fails, it won't be for the same reasons that the second one failed. And sure enough, it was a successful soft landing. Congratulations to India. I, I bring greetings from the United States and surely from the entire world on this.